Thank you for downloading this podcast from Emmanuel Church Lurgan. At Emmanuel, our vision is to help rewrite the story of Craigavon, Ireland and the nations with the good news of the Kingdom of God. We hope you enjoy listening to this message. Um, we're finishing off this morning. Sorry, I keep looking. That's the only screen I can actually see from here, so I can see what's up here. So you're going to have to trust me in that. We're finishing off this morning. It's just lovely to hear all the stories of what God is doing amongst our young people and older people. And you know that um, at the beginning, over Christmas time, that I felt God spoke to me about the first hundred days of this year that they were very significant. Well, this is day a hundred. Um, so this is the hundredth day of, of the new year. So I don't know what's going to happen between now and midnight, but I'm, I'm excited <laughs> about that. And I tell you, I've had a battle this week. It's been one of those weeks, and we buried Reggie this week as well. And those things take a, a, a toll on you. And um, so it's been one of those weeks. But here we are, and we're finishing this week on this idea because we run into Easter next week. And then we're going to start, start a brand new series um, after Easter. Facing our future and living our rhythms has been great. Um, we've looked at the... It started acting the 13th of February. And I took you to what um, I called was your upper room. What was your upper room? Looking at what happened in the upper room back in the Acts. What, was, what about your upper room? Now, on the 20th of February, believe it or not, we relaunched um, communion. That was now... Didn't have to bring your own anymore. And um, Dave did that with a title, More Than Enough. And then we looked at what surrender looks like. And then we took four weeks looking at breakthrough, what breakthrough is like within us, what happens when it happens among us, and what happens when it, it goes out into the community. And then, of course, last week, Dave led us to think about what's next and about the idea that we can have God without measure. What I want to do this week is I want to talk to you basically about this here, that we're called for more. We're called for more. And now, to do that, I want to read in um, uh, Exodus, one of my favorite, many favorite passages, but this is one of my favorite stories, Exodus chapter 3, and we're going to read the first six verses, if you want to look at up in your device, or if you want to follow the screens, you can, all right? It says this, now, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw uh, that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why? the bush does not burn up. That's an interesting little phrase. I've highlighted it, bolded it there. I'm going to think about that in a moment or two, all right? And then it says, and when the Lord saw, interesting, isn't it? The follow-up to that is when the Lord saw that Moses had gone over to look, God called him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here am I. He says, do not come any closer, God said, take off your sandals. Now you know what the flip-flops were, all right? Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abram, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. But this Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Interesting. The Lord always blesses the public reading of his word today. There's no difference. So God, we pray that you'll bless it to us and you'll speak for your sons and your daughters are listening in Jesus' name. Moses is in a really good place when this happens. Interesting how we tend to think sometimes that God moves when we're in a really bad place. We want God to move when trials come, when difficulties come, whenever trouble comes our way. Actually, Moses is in a really good place here. Um, And you can't actually think too much about the goodness and the triumph of chapter 3 of Exodus until you think about the tragedy of chapter 2. And chapter 2 was a bit of a tragedy because what happened was, you know, if you know the story of Moses, he was adopted into the Egyptian family of Pharaoh, but he was a Hebrew. And as he grew up, he began to realize that there was a difference between him and his Egyptian family. He began to realize that it just wasn't the color of his skin that was different to his family. 
he began to realize that this passion in his heart was more for the slave in the field than it was for his family in the palace. He began to see the injustices of what was going on outside the palace walls. And in chapter 2, what happens is he's out surveying this one day, and he sees a Hebrew being beaten by an Egyptian taskmaster. And he's been beaten wickedly. He's been whipped wickedly. And Moses injects himself into the scene. He interferes. He jumps in between these two people, and a tussle arises, and he ends up in his temper because Moses had a little bit of a temper problem. And in his temper, he killed the Egyptian taskmaster. He buries him in the sand, hoping it's all gone away. That's what we do, isn't it? When we make a mistake, we bury it. We think it'll go away. We think just because we hide it, that it'll go away. But it didn't go away. The following day, he's out and he sees two Hebrew boys and they're having a bit of a fight and they're has come to fisticuffs. And he jumps in between these two boys and he says, come on guys, settle down. We're part of the same family here. You shouldn't be fighting each other. And of course, they speak to Moses with sarcasm and they say, so what are you going to do about it? Are you going to kill us like you killed the guy who you thought you hid yesterday? You can't hide your mistakes. And you certainly can't hide sin. And so even what happens here, this guy, Moses, who begins to realize that this is spreading like wildfire through the camp, he goes on the run. He does what, does what most of us done, does, do. Um, <clears throat> I'm just breaking these teeth in. Um, he does what most of us do. He, when he can't hide it, he runs away from it. So he, first of all, he tries to hide the sin. And when he realizes he can't hide it, then he goes on the run. And he's on the run and he's a murderer on the run. He arrives in Midian. He's nothing. He thinks all of Egypt's after him. The Egyptian pharaoh has his henchmen looking out for him all over, I'm sure. And um, he is uh, a fugitive from all of Egypt. They're wanting him dead. He feels lost. He feels like his life is over. Wouldn't it have been lovely if God had it spoke to him then? <laughs> Wouldn't it have been lovely if God, when, 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 when all is gone, wouldn't it have been lovely that God would have reeled him in then and got a burning bush and said, Moses, don't worry. I know you've made a mistake, but um, don't worry about that. It's all going to be okay. But that wasn't what happened. What happened was he met a girl and the girl brought him home to meet her father and brought him into Jethro's family. All of a sudden, what we see in the next 40 years span, because that was sort of is between chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Exodus, he's given a life, he's given a job, he's given a family, he's got a boys, he's given a wife, he's got a brand new start. This murderer, this guy who made a mistake... Uh, He has got a brand new start. And if you're here this morning and maybe you've been trying to hide something in your life and now it's come out and you're on the run a little bit and you feel like you're on the run from everybody and you're on the run from God, God is here to say to you this morning that he can give you a brand new start. That's the beauty of this. He can give you a brand new start. Listening to the stories, um, David's uh, video this week and what he shared this morning thinking of how these people need a new start they need a new life they need help and um, it's lovely just to think of the help so broadly uh, how David brought that out this morning so maybe you're in a season of hiding and you're here today or you've tuned in today I'm here to tell you that I'm here to say to you don't throw in the towel I'm here to tell you not to give up because if you've got breath in your body then you've got destiny in your soul and I'm here to tell you this morning that you're called for more you're called for more. God, I don't care how bad your mistake, how big the mess you've made. If you woke this morning, I can tell you it wasn't the alarm in your phone that woke you this morning. It was the grace of God that woke you this morning. You're, you're, you've been awakened for another day because you've been called for more. And as I say, up until this point, Moses has got a wife, he's got a family, he's got a job, he's now 80, he's gotten over his failures. Time has passed, a lot of time. He's had some healing. His failures are now in the history. And he's just settled in to being a good husband, a good father, a good employee. And at this point, 
At this point, God comes knocking and calling again. I'm not sure how Moses felt about that, but I sort of wondered how I would feel. I might have said to God something like, God, I'm settled now. If you'd have done this 40 years ago, it would have been good, but not now. It's okay now. I'm okay. I've been to links. I've got counsel, and I'm okay. Head down to Rick's house. He needs you, God, but not me. I'm okay. I'm fine, thank you. If you'd have come to me when I was busted and disgusted, that would have been okay. But not now. Not now. I'm, o- I'm okay. I'm good, Lord. I'm good. Give it, a, give it a miss. Well, I've got news for you. Jesus comes and calls you not just from trials. God calls you from comfort. And in our Western civilization, I wonder sometimes, do we preach far too much how God brings you out of trial? And do we not preach enough how God brings you out of comfort? And God's maybe calling you out of the comfort of your situation this morning. And if you thought comfort was the goal, you're wrong. Comfort is never the goal. Kingdom is the goal. Jesus didn't die on the cross to make you comfortable. Jesus died on the cross to build his kingdom. It's not about comfort. It's about kingdom. And for all of you in the room who think, it sort of passed you by because you're in the, now I'm going to be real good at this. I'm, I was looking forward to this line. You're in the 65 plus bracket. That just gives, I'm still in the young bracket then. <laughs> and if you're in the 65 plus bracket and you think that it's all for the younger people, that it's for the younger generations, then I am here to tell you that you're wrong. It's not about your comfort. It's not about your retirement God is calling you. You have more wisdom than anybody else in the room, I think. And we need that wisdom. Why, why, would, why would you sit back now and close the doors to the wisdom that God has allowed you to derive over all of your lifetime, all of the experience? Why would you close the doors to that, to a generation that needed more than ever? You are called to more, you 65-year-old pluses. It's a long time for me to get there. But, and as we go into this Easter season, as we go into this holiday season, as we go into the community next weekend in the big church serve, why don't you receive more of God this morning? If God has called you to more, more of his grace, more of his love, more of his spirit, more of his kingdom, because he has called you for more. Three things that I want to pick out of Moses' story really quick this morning, um, and then we're going to pray. The first thing was, don't let comfort distract you. Don't let comfort distract you. Moses doesn't run away, which I find interesting. Moses says this little phrase that we bolded, I will turn aside and see this great sight. My friend, listen to me. God is great at getting people's attention. Be careful you don't miss it. Be careful you don't miss it. The eternal God of heaven wants to take you deeper um, than, than, than you've ever gone before. So don't be distracted. Don't be distracted by either your trial or your comfort, by the anxiety of your job, by the pressure of your family, or by the comfort of your present life. One of my saddest things in 30 years of doing this job, one of the saddest things that I've seen happen time and time again is praying for people when they're really down and watching God turn their circumstances totally around and watching prosperity and goodness come their way and them walking away from God. It is one of the saddest things I've watched and I've saw time and time again where in the in the moment where they've cried out to God, God has come and God has touched and God has healed and they've walked away and they've forgotten. Please don't miss the invitation to the great because you've settled for the good. And don't miss the more of God for things that have no eternal significance. I'm not against good things. I like good things, all right? Even though the good things, don't settle for them and miss the more of God. All right, the burning, the, the, the bush is burning. This is the thing, and, and God is calling out to him. The second thing I would say to you this morning is examine what lies between. Now, let me explain that. The bush is burnt, burning, it's not being consumed, and to beat all that, it's talking. 
Funny, isn't it? God is speaking through a fire out of a bush. And the first thing he does is he calls Moses twice. He says, Moses, Moses, he knows you intimately. But then he says a strange thing. He says, Moses, don't come near. Take off your sandals from your feet for the place where you're standing is holy ground. I imagine this is a, this is a, a stronger slider than Moses was wearing. I imagine his was a lot thinner than this. But the only thing that was between his flesh and the holy ground in which he was standing was a little piece of leather. But don't forget he was a shepherd. I hope I'm not being offensive today, but he'd probably walked on some dung. And God didn't want him to bring the dung of his past into the destiny of his future. And so he says, the thing that lies between you and me The peace that between me and the holy ground that you stand on, I want you to get rid of it. I want you to, he's saying, what he's saying is he's saying, he's not saying I don't want you to draw near. He's saying I don't want you to draw near as you are. Can I say to the people, just for a moment, who, who work with me, our staff, we have 16, 17 staff here, and our host of volunteers. The honor and privilege it is to get to work here. I've worked here all of my life now. Well, since church started 26 years ago. And um, there's a danger to become familiar and just start walking in with your shoes on. There's a danger that we just walk in the way we are. And we think this is for everybody else, but we actually don't think it's for us. That we actually need to challenge ourselves. What lies between? What lies between? What is the thing that this moment in time that robs my absolute obedience to God? What is the thing? What is the thing that that creates the, the gap? God is saying, remove the things that lie between because there's something about his sovereign power. There's something. And if you want to be called to more, then you're going to have to take your shoes off. You're going to have to get rid of that dung from yesterday and that dirt that's got trapped between you and him. It might be on forgiveness. It might be an addiction to pornography. It might be an addiction to alcohol. I don't know. It might just be arrogance or self-righteousness or pride or failure to seek him first. I don't know what it is, but you've left your shoes on way too long and the tenderness of feeling you know when you're walking without your shoes you feel the ground you can feel the ground you're walking on imagine imagine that what has happened is the hardness of our souls we've got to a place where where you used to sorrow over that sin That weakness, that thing, you used to weep, that used to keep you up at night. Now it never costs you thought. You see, because you just got way too used to coming into his presence with your shoes on. Got way too used to just taking for granted that we can walk into his presence any old way we like. And we can't do that. And he's challenging them here. He's saying, you need to get rid of what lies between. Moses, I need you to feel who I am again. I need you to feel me in your toes again. Because you see, Moses, not many days from now, you're going to stand in front of the mightiest man on planet Earth. On my, on, in a few days' time, on those same feet that you're standing before me now, you're going to stand before the mightiest man on, on Earth, the Pharaoh. And this time, he's, he's big, he's scary. And I don't want you to run like the last time, Moses. And so you're going to need to know at this moment, you're, need to go and you're, you're going to have to absorb all the power of heaven. That's why I need you to take your shoes off. I need you to see how big your God is. I need you to know who I am. Diane Disney wrote her biography. And Diane Disney was the, the daughter of Walt Disney. And she tells this funny story, true story in her book. Um, she said that... Growing up in the Walt Disney home was very, very normal. And she said when she was a little girl, she had no idea. She didn't actually 
correspond that her dad and was Walt Disney. She just didn't. She said it just didn't land. Her, their home life was so normal. And her, she said, on her first day of, of, of primary school, they were going around the, the class saying their name. And when it came to her, and the teacher said, "Tell the class your name." She says, "My name's Diane Disney." And the class all started to clap and cheer, and Diane started to cry. And the teacher said to her, why are you crying? And she says, well, they're all making fun of me. And the teacher says, no, no, they're not making fun of you, honey. They're just celebrating who your dad is. And Diane Disney goes, who, who, my, my dad, Walter Disney? What's, what, my, and, and the teacher says, Walt Disney? Disneyland? Disney World? Like, your brother is Mickey Mouse? Your cousin's goofy. And she goes, she said it was the first time, the first time, four years of age, she said the first time she realized her dad was actually Walt Disney. And she went home really cross. Her dad was reading the paper. She pulled the paper and she says, you didn't tell me you were Walt Disney. But she said this in her book. She said for months afterwards, as a little girl, she walked around and oh of who her dad was. My dad is Walt Disney. You see, here's the thing. Your father didn't create Disneyland. Your father created all the lands. Your father, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Your God, he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last. He is a good, good father. He is a healing father. He is a saving father. He is a good good father. You say this morning, yeah, let's give him praise this morning because he's a good father. And you might say this morning, Phil, but you don't know what I'm going through. And I'm not here to minimize your problem in any shape or form, but I'm here to maximize your God and tell you that we have a good, good father. And here's the thing. Don't let comfort distract you. Examine what lies between. And here's the little thing that catches me. Maybe, just maybe, God is waiting on you to move. There's a little verse in James that says, "Just draw near unto God, and He will draw near unto you." I remember when I was a boy, um, my two big brothers, Alan and Nori. Alan's here, and Nori. They preached all their lives, and they were preaching back then when I was ten, eleven years of age. They were preaching. Nori's 11 years older than me. Nori's the oldest, and Alan's just a little bit younger than that, so he's older than me, but not much. But I remember thinking, I, I want to be like that. I remember when I was a boy, I remember thinking, I, I want to do that. That's what I want to do. I watched my two big brothers preach. And then I remember when I turned 20, they were still doing it. They were 30, and I was 20, and they were still doing it. And I was thinking, I, I want to be like them. I want to be, I want to do what they're doing. I began to realize that you need to do it. (laughs) It just doesn't happen. You need to actually do it. And maybe God is waiting for you. You see, here's the thing. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush. Did you hear what I said there? When God saw, when God saw that he turned aside to see, when God saw he got his attention, thought, now I'll talk to him. Now I've got his attention No point in me talking to you whenever I don't have your attention. You see, God defeated Satan at at Calvary through Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. He has made the first move. He has made the first move. It was when we were still sinners that Christ died for the ungodly. You see, here's the thing. I can remember the very first time I was at a conference in America, and I can remember the first time I ever came upon Noblis Fawcett's, where you just... And I remember going to wash my hands and I couldn't get the water on. And I twisted this thing and I done, and the water wouldn't go on. And I did this and did this and stood back and walked forward. Couldn't get the thing to go. I thought I'd wait and watch to somebody do it, but there was just happened to be nobody else. That's how I got through school, watching everybody else do it. But anyway, and then I couldn't get this thing to go. And then, you know, here's what happened. I just did this. I just did this. If you get this, we could probably quit sooner than later. This morning, maybe God just waiting for some of you just to do this. 
maybe just waiting for your attention. Maybe for a long time you've been walking around thinking, when's God going to come to me? And when's God going to do this to me? And maybe this morning he just needs you to do this. And when I did that, the water came. You see, here's the thing. God wants to use you in a driver way. Amber, would you come and we'll finish? I'd love to pray for people. Just if you'd play a little bit, I'd love to pray um, for you. Interesting, some more things I could say, but interesting, actually, the very thing that God called Moses to do was the very thing he couldn't do. He says, I want you to go and I want you to speak to Pharaoh. And Moses says, me? Speak, God? You know I can't speak. And it looks like he may have some kind of a speech impediment. But whatever it was, he wasn't good with his words. And he said, God, I, I, I don't think I can do that. I'm not the right person. I'm not even good at speaking. You see, he wasn't in denial. He wasn't trying to make excuses. He was actually telling the truth. But if you're going to put the facts on the table when it comes to God... Always make sure you put the truth on the table with it. And I've said this to you before. I shared this actually on the 13th of February. Back in 2006, out of that verse, Ephesians 3.20, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I ask or think, according to the power that works in me, power of God. And the fact is, I may not be able But the truth is, he is able. That's the thing. The fact may be that sin is tough and temptation comes our way, seeks to demolish us. But the truth is this, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The fact is, I can't do it on my own. But the truth is, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Make sure when you give the facts, you put the truth on the table as well. The fact is, I'm tired. I don't feel like praising God, but the truth is, I will bless the Lord at all times, and His praise shall continually be in my mouth. The fact is that the enemy is inflicting serious injury on the church at this moment in time, but the truth is, no weapon that's formed against it shall prosper. That's the truth. The fact is, you feel burned out and weary, But the truth is, you will rise up with wings like eagles, walk and not be weary, run and not faint. The fact may be you're crying yourself to sleep at night, but the truth is, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. The fact is, we're watching Ukraine being bombarded by Russia We're watching the world implode before our very eyes. That's the truth. The enemy creating havoc and dismay all around the world. But the truth is, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness are of the world and they that dwell on. Listen, my friends, the king is still on the throne. The king is still on the throne. Life is for real. Tough times come our way. Loved ones may die, but listen, eternity is real. Heaven is waiting, and there's a never-ending eternity of awesomeness. So don't let your comforts distract you. Examine what lies between you and him this morning. And maybe, just maybe, God is waiting for you this morning just to do this. Just to do this. Saying, God, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm going to take the shoes off. I'm going to take the dirt and the dung from yesterday. I'm not going to allow it to affect my future and my destiny. And this morning, I'm just going to do this. Can you stand with me as we close? Here's the truth this morning. You're called for more. You're called for more. You're called for more. As we go into the community next week, we're called for more. As we talk to the people door to door, as we look them in the eye and tell them that we have the answer to this. We have Jesus. We have the greatest thing that ever, ever they could have. So, Father, I pray this morning that as we...
come before you, God, that there'll be people in this room this morning that will just take that step and say, God, I've been waiting for you to move. I've been waiting and I've been praying that you would come, but God, I've realized that I haven't dealt with what lies between. And this morning, I take my shoes off this morning. And I just do this. I just put my hands out and I say, God, would you come? Would you take control? Would you lead me into what's next? Would you lead me into the destiny that you've planned for me, O oh God? Because you are my king and you are my God. And I will ever praise you, God. So Lord, seal your word. Bless us as we have tea and coffee now and fellowship one of another. Lord, we pray too that this word won't just um, go in one ear and out the other. We pray, O oh God, that it will land on, on good soil good soil that will sow in the kingdom of righteousness for his name's sake. Amen. We hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast. For more information about our church and all that we do, please visit our website at emmanuel-church.co.uk.